Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to another Rock Growth Candids. I think that this is going to be a very interesting uh, evening uh, as we talk to Erica Fee, who is the festival producer and board president of the Key Bank Rochester Fringe Festival. Welcome, Erica. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. Uh, and perhaps, I mean, we should start off with something really basic. Yeah. What is a Fringe Festival really? How does it different? How is it differentiated from all other festivals that are out there? Sure. So, um, I'll, how many of you have been to Rochester Fringe? Oh, good. How many of you haven't? This is fantastic. Wow. Okay. So, not not too many of you haven't. So. Uh, Rochester Fringe is a result, let me first say, of kind of what we call the grandmother of all fringes, which is the Edinburgh Fringe in Edinburgh, Scotland. And what happened was in 1947, there was a curated theater festival called the Edinburgh International Festival. Can you still hear me? This is kind of, sounds like it's going. Good. Um, which um, which what is a curated theater festival. It still exists today. And in 1947, there were eight groups who are not invited to participate because it was by invitation only. Um, so they just turned up in Edinburgh anyway with their sets and their costumes and their props and this kind of post-war spirit. And they put on their shows. They found space above pubs and in lecture halls at the University of Edinburgh. And there was a reviewer who thought, well, that's, that's interesting that eight groups <laughs> together turned up, um, but it's never going to happen two years running. It was, it was just a fluke. Um, and then it did happen uh, the next year. So he thought, okay, I've got to call this something. So he nicknamed it the Festival Fringe. He also said he didn't think it would continue. Well, it wound up snowballing to become what's now the largest arts festival in the world. It lasts the entire month of August, 30 days. And this year's uh, Edinburgh Fringe had about 60,000 performances. So it's huge. It's huge. And it's resulted in the birth of about 250 fringe festivals worldwide. So everything from um, in those festivals, everything from theater to comedy, dance, music, uh, children's entertainment, multidisciplinary performances, shows that can't even be classified as well. Um, and and so, so there's about 250 in the world with about 50 in the United States. They tend to be very open access. They tend to have some sort of open access component. And we can really geek out and I can go down the rabbit hole for like the next hour if you really want on the different fringe festival models, which I'm sure none of you want to hear about. But um, they're, they're, they all tend to, you know, just be very open in terms of having a way that shows can get in kind of on the ground floor. So whether it's a show that's a, a new group that's trying out new work, or it's a seasoned uh, professional group, and they're also trying out often new work, um, it's a way that they can get in front of audiences. And so that's what fringe festivals really allow. They allow for um, a degree of access for artists to get in front of new audiences. And can you specifically talk about the Rochester Fringe Festival and how, what were you doing and kind of how did you uh, get involved in, in getting it going? Yeah, so my personal story, um, so I can't tell the whole part of it. We'll do that like a midnight rock okay, roast. Okay, okay. But, um, <laughs> but uh, the, no, I mean, there's nothing really salacious about it, but, um, but that sounds more exciting, right? Uh, so what happened was in 2009, I was living in London. I had my own theater production company. I was producing in the UK, I was producing on tour in the UK, in London, and also at the Edinburgh Fringe, where I had quite a bit of experience producing, directing, acting. Um, I came into producing through acting. I was a, a professional actress. Um, I went to the University of Rochester, and following graduation, I went to grad school in London, where I became a classically trained actress. Um, and and I, so I got into producing that way. And so I was living in London with, with uh, my own uh, theater production company, and I happened to be back in Rochester in the summer of 2009, and I was talking to the head of the theater department at the University of Rochester, Nigel Master, and he's not here. I'm just pointing to Missy because she knows him. <laughs> How weird. Why did I do that? Um, anyway, <laughs> Missy and Nigel over there. Uh, <laughs> So I was talking to Nigel, and I said to him, why is it that Rochester doesn't have a fringe festival? And he said, it's funny you should ask that, 
you should go and meet with Joel Seligman. He's working on this right now. And I said, like, I'm going to get an appointment with Joel Seligman on my week back. You know, I, I'd met him one time, but it's like a reservation at a fine dining restaurant. You don't know, just waltz into the president's office at the University of Rochester. Well, um, actually, there was an upcoming meeting, um, and I was asked to attend. And they had a, a variety of stakeholders who had actually been meeting for an entire year at that point. They were trying to figure out some sort of performing arts festival for Rochester, and they were looking at different models. And I wound up, uh, you know, uh, they were talking about a fringe model, and I wound up volunteering. And, and I, I told you this on the phone, but Joel was actually getting into the elevator. <laughs> I ran up to him, and I said, if you want a fringe festival, I want to come back and run it. And he said, thank you so much, Erica. And the doors closed, and I thought, <laughs> like, why did I just why did I do that? But um, and I left and I thought, oh, that was kind of embarrassing that I just kind of shouted into the elevator. And But then he did contact me and he said, can you put together a proposal? And so I did and one thing led to another and I came back to Rochester in December 2009 to head it up. And I'm coming up on my 10 year, 10 year anniversary. I love the imagery, by the way of Joel Seligman sitting at all these like monthly board meetings working on a fringe festival. Yeah. But, um, and, yeah. Then, and then how did that work out? Like what is it that actually kind of got the first one going? Because you mentioned it came back in 2009. Sure. The first one was in 2012. Yeah. How did it all finally come together? So part of that story is the midnight version of this, um, <laughs> of this show. But no, um, basically what happened was is that we had a group of stakeholders, a, a smaller group. It was kind of a steering committee that the university put together and I helped put together too. And that was about seven people. And we, we were meeting and at that point it was being led by the university all of 2010. And that had its benefits and also its challenges because they're a large institution and um, and, and again, there, there are pluses and minuses to that. But uh, be that as it may, in 2011, they told us that they could no longer really lead the charge of putting together a festival. And so our steering committee bonded together and had people on the committee like Tony Bannon, who was director, um, the, you know, head director at uh, George Eastman House, Ruby Lockhart of Garth Fagan Dance, Mark Cuddy, Jiva Theater Center, Mark Costello, who's an entertainment lawyer in town, Darren Stevenson from Push Physical Theater, David Henderson from Method Machine, myself. And uh, we bonded together and we decided, you know what? Even though we don't have a big sponsor anymore, we actually have nothing but our ideas and a plan, we're going to forge ahead with this. And so we did. And um, we immediately uh, met with Justin Vigdor. And before he could say no, we elected him board chairman before he, <laughs> before he knew what was happening. And yeah, so we were kind of a team of, there were seven or, or eight of us. And we just, we went on from there. And then we were able to get the university back on board as a partner, but also because it was no longer being led by the University of Rochester, we also had RIT that came on board and then SUNY Geneseo and the College of Brockport, Nazareth College, St. John Fisher College and also sponsors like First Niagara came on board. And then we, and we are a nonprofit organization. So we became a nonprofit, a 501c3 that very year. Um, and the community foundation and other foundations in town were really instrumental in helping us get off the ground. I mean, now that you've had kind of seven years into actually running these, the, these festivals, what is, how is, uh, how things evolve? How have they changed? And, what is this Rochester model that's, that's developed? Sure, so what the Rochester model is, is that we are a bifurcated festival. So we have the Edinburgh model as part of our model, and the, that Edinburgh portion is where shows can apply to perform at the festival. And we have a variety of venues, such as Jiva Theater Center, Blackfriars Theater, School of the Arts, uh, Eastman School of Music, the list goes on and on. And anyone can apply for free to perform at one of those venues. And our application process will be opening um, up in 2020, you know, earlier in 2020 than we've, than we've ever opened before. But when you apply online for free at rochesterfringe.com, you can check off the venues you're interested in. 
your applications go on through, and then the venues themselves choose the programming. We don't get involved in that programming aspect at all. We do not tell the venues what to program. Uh, it's totally their own decision. Uh, we have very few rules for them, too, and so we're not fussy about censorship, anything like that. However, we also do program some headline entertainment, and we do that to really uh, draw focus to the festival, and our whole idea is that if we book some big headline acts, people will come downtown, and then we hope that they'll stay downtown, and they'll see multiple shows in one evening, which has worked for us. So we book, uh, we bring in a Spiegel tent. Uh, we have a headline comedian at Eastman Theater. Uh, we have some really fun kind of outdoor shows that are so or site-specific shows. But the thing that results in our being called the Rochester model, because what I've just described to you is kind of similar to what Philadelphia Fringe was already doing. Mm -hmm. But what makes us different is that we do these big free outdoor shows too. And we're the only fringe festival in the world doing that. So when we uh, book Parcel 5, this year we had Plasticien Volant return. We've had uh, Circus Orange, Bandaloop, uh, Streb, the list goes on. And we have those huge spectacle type performances that are available to the public, free of charge to the public. That's what results in our being called the Rochester model. Now, I've kind of read and, and, and heard that oftentimes fringe festivals in different places, they're somewhat reflective of, of the audiences uh, in kind of their, their location. What is it that after seven years you feel you, you and others who organize the Rochester one uh, have learned about what Rochester audiences are like? Well, um, in, and this was actually our eighth year. This past year was our eighth year. And but it's funny that you sh that I should even say that we just finished our eighth festival because it's like dog years for us. You know, it doesn't feel like eight years. Like it's like oh, it's been a lifetime. Let me tell you, um, <laughs> like a, I'm really like a fake cigarette, like with a, <laughs> to tell you all the stories. But you know, one thing, and I and I know I talked to you about the, this on the phone yesterday, is. One thing that we have learned about Rochester audiences, which I think a lot of people might find surprising, is they're not as conservative as people might think. There's this perception that Rochester audiences are, you know, can only see, you know, theater or, or shows of a certain, you know, rank. And it, that is not what we see at all. We see the edgier, the better. That is what people really want to see. If we see a group that has performed before, they better do something different for Fringe because, or people aren't going to want to see it. There better be a mashup, a collaboration, something new. And that's what we find the audiences flock to at Fringe. So we're not seeing any of this kind of smug town, uh, you know, c conservative Rochester stereotype at all going on. What is it that, um, what is it that you think that um, perhaps kind of looking into the, the next few years, I mean, how, how do you see a Fringe Festival uh, kind of unfolding and evolving over time? Sure. So, well, so much of them happen organically that it's, it's in many ways, it's difficult to predict. We can see how Fringes are happening that are, uh, have existed for longer in other communities, and so we can kind of track and predict a little bit. But, you know, what we would love to see is that the fringe becomes more and more reflective of its community. You know, that's really a goal of ours. This year we had a new satellite venue location in the Joseph Avenue um, section of the city. We hope for that section to grow. We hope for, uh, to have more venues in that section. When we add satellite locations, we don't just add like a venue here, a venue there without thinking. We try to add a hub. So we try to add several venues at once so that they can cross-populate and flourish together. We've seen that from other festivals that if you just add a venue, you know, out without any support around it, that that venue can fail. And that's not what we want. What we also want to be able to do, and it's very important for us, is to ensure the health of our venues. We want people to experience the beauty and the power of the performing arts. So it's very important to us that we're getting people downtown and that they're, they're um, attending these venues, many of them for the first time. What we see that's very gratifying to us 
is that they're then coming back. You know, we hear that from our venues, that they can see that those people are now attending other shows. So we want to see that, you know, more and more, that we're getting people, you know, downtown into venues that they may have not attended otherwise or, or something that they're going to frequent more and more often. Um, but yes, I mean, we want it to be definitely much more uh, reflective, as reflective as it possibly can be of the community, but also something that's quite important to us is that it gives Rochester a real shot in the arm every year. And we found this year the overwhelming feedback that we had was that it brought so much joy to the community. And we think Rochester needs that. I mean, all communities need that, right? And uh, festivals can really help a community's self-esteem, and they can show us what we can achieve when we work together. And so I think that sometimes the lessons that we learn during festivals like Fringe can carry on throughout the year. We, we want to see more of that. And of course, we always want to be able to provide a platform for artists. We want to be able to allow artists to get a, a, a start, you know, whether they're starting off or whether they're seasoned professionals. So we, we as a festival are committed to, over the next few years, we're in the planning stages, to make it more accessible, more financially accessible to artists, more accessible overall so that we can have more and more people participate. So it's interesting that you talked about kind of this community self-esteem. You obviously had been away for, I believe, 10 or 11 years, mm -hmm. uh, living in London, kind of around the UK, I mean, being in the UK. Uh, what's been your sense since you moved back a decade ago? Uh, yeah. And now being back kind of in your hometown? I mean, what's what, what do you think of Rochester? Well, that's a really good question. You know, I think that there's a saying that you can only live in New York for, you either live in New York for 10 years or you live there forever because at the end of 10 years, you, you either decide, okay, I can't handle this anymore and I have to, I have, to have a different um, standard of living or different quality of life or I just can't handle the commute. And I think the same is to be said, the same is absolutely to be said of, of London and probably all big cities. Um, so, I, but I myself have seen Rochester, and we've seen this throughout the festival. We've seen more and more people come downtown. We've seen people far more comfortable with coming downtown. Um, one thing that we found the first year in 2012, when we did, um, we, we had Bandaloop at Martin Luther King Jr. Park, we had so many people calling asking us, where on earth do I park for Martin Luther King Jr. Park? And we're like, oh my God, you park in the Sio Street garage. They're like, well, I'd have to change, you know, I'd have to move my car again. It's literally a four minute walk, like maybe five if you're, if you're going slowly that day. But, um, and then we found what was very interesting is that senior citizens who were so used to downtown and so used to the vibrancy of downtown, they were kind of schooling younger people on how you get places. Like the younger people had absolutely no idea how to get anywhere. You get an octogenarian there and they've, you know, they'll tell you all the shortcuts. Um, and so we, that was hilarious, I thought, the first year. But now that's changed. And so we see uh, more and more young people just very familiar with downtown and, and much just much more comfortable. So I mean, thinking about um, just the role of, of things like festivals, I mean, Fringe Festival in particular, but just the role of festivals in community. You talked about self-esteem, obviously there's a, an economic impact as well, uh, but what is maybe your, your bigger sense about what it is that something like the Rochester Fringe brings to Rochester? So, I mean, aside from the economic impact and economic activity that festivals, as we all know, well, hopefully we all know, can bring to a city, I, you know, there is something to be said. And there is actually a recent study that showed that music festivals can have a hugely positive effect on a city's health, that it's not just you know, oh my goodness, somebody spent some extra dollars on a restaurant. No, it's because we have this community connection because we're so used to having our heads in our phones. We're so used to being, you know, in front of a, a laptop and doing our own thing. But when we have this experience together, when we're all experiencing the performing arts and it's something perhaps on such a grand scale that you have to put your phone down or you're actually in a venue and you have to put your phone down. Um, we are bonding together as a community, so it can it can really help 
with community cohesion. It can help with uh, community self-esteem because, and this is something that we hear all the time, people come to the, our big free outdoor shows or, or they'll just come to the fringe to any show and they'll say, I can't believe this is Rochester. And we say, well, like, why not? You know, why, 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 are, why isn't this Rochester? When we brought the Spiegel tent in the first year, we had a variety of people, even people on the news calling it the Spiegel tent, kind of rolling their eyes. You know, why are we bringing in this tent from Belgium? Who cares? And by the end saying, well, this is Rochester's Spiegel tent now. Like, no, well, no, we don't own it. We have to send it off, you know, somewhere else. But um, I think that Rochester, you know, really threw its arms around it. But I do think that through these community events, we're able to see what we're able to achieve together as a community. We're able to see different sorts of people. Maybe we're seeing different people than we see through the rest of the day or in the rest of our, our, our standard routine because people are coming downtown because they have a love of the arts. And that really should cut across all sorts of socioeconomic uh, and, and uh, geographic boundaries. I mean, one of the things that I think is relatively uh, kind of commonly accepted in the entrepreneurial community is that it's particularly hard to start a nonprofit and especially one which re which requires a lot of people to participate mm. and then to keep it going year after year. Yeah. And you've done all those things. Well, we try not to think about that too much, you know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, think about it for a minute, maybe just in, in terms of what is it you feel you learned more from the kind of, you know, social entrepreneur uh, standpoint that that you think is uh, could be interesting lessons for others who are thinking of doing some similar things. Well, I don't know. I mean, in some ways, it's a team effort. So, in in every way, this is a team effort, and that is a huge. I don't know if that's a lesson because I would hope that people would inherently know that, but it, this is not possible without so many different components. And they all have to work together. And honestly, half the time I feel like I'm playing, well, as some of our board members would know who, here, who are here this evening, it's more than half the, half the time. I feel like I'm playing whack-a-mole. So I'm like hitting like, OK, we got that thing. OK, all right, this just popped up. Um, so you do need to be constantly flexible in order to address issues. But I, you know, I think that if you can somehow get people, and when I say people, I mean a, a variety of different groups behind some sort of shared vision, you might, you might stand a chance. Um, but I, I don't know that, that I have you know, a particular lesson aside from the fact that it's, it's total teamwork. And if somebody wants to somehow participate, and, and last year, or this year rather, what, about 100,000 people were at this event? So for those maybe who are business owners in the audience who may want to market yeah. themselves at it? I mean, kind of, what are the ways that they can go about doing that? So, well, we actually, as being a nonprofit, we always are in need of sponsorships. And so we do have a variety of sponsorships that are available to people. If anyone wanted to participate in terms of, of a perform, as a performer, our application process, I don't know, if, am I allowed, am I allowed, okay, we'll be opening mid-February next year. So that's a little earlier. So that will be for, you know, for free at rochesterfringe.com. Yeah. Anyone can fill in an application. Um, and then, you know, the other thing that we really encourage, and we saw a lot of this year, is get your friends to come, you know, create an event, drag people downtown. Uh, we saw so much of that this year. We had just many, many reports of people saying, you know what, I finally organized this group. And and that really introduced people to the festival and they kind of fell in love with it. I think that being a fringe festival and having this year 667 performances, it's difficult to wrap your arms around, you know, absolutely. So you kind of do need a guide. Mm -hmm. And so if, if you have attended the festival uh, in the past, which most of you have, bring some extra people next year that haven't attended. That would be great. So, and this will be the last question before we take some audience questions. Okay. Has there been perhaps one or two acts uh, since 2012 that have been particularly kind of your favorite artistic uh, acts? So I can't answer that question because oh, that's like... Like your children? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't answer it. 
Okay. <laughs> I can't answer at all. There have been, you know, obviously, you know, anytime we're doing one of the free big outdoor spectacular acts, mm -hmm. those are amazing and always a challenge for us. Uh, you know, we always have like this year, we had the challenge of how on earth do we get helium uh, in a helium shortage? Uh, but so there's always some sort of new learning curve in terms of that, but no, they're all they're all equally loved. Oh, <laughs> excellent. Well, thank you, Erica. Let's give her a hand, and then we'll have some audience. Questions.